Well, Owen, it's Thursday again. Again? Yeah, sorry. Uh, I have some bad news for you. <laughs> I've um, I've eaten two donuts and I've had a Red Bull <laughs> on I, accident. I don't see what the bad news is. I can just let you do the show. Yeah, yeah. You know, I just get a little saucy when I'm uh, when I'm all hopped up on the on the taurine and the guadana. I don't even know what that is, or if that's how to pronounce it, but it's Thursday. And as folks can see, we're going to be starting on page 79 of the Fantasy Age Basic Rulebook. And if you were checking out any of our links from Twitter, or I don't think I shared it on Facebook. Maybe I ought to. Um, I would. Free stunt tables. I think I'm going to do that. Free stunt tables, you can download them, follow along. The stream is live on Facebook, Twitter, Twitch, and YouTube. You know, Owen, I was looking through some of our past Thursdays, and um, we run a pretty attractive uh, program. Is that so? Yeah, yeah. I, I have my doubts. No, no, I like it. It looks real sharp. I think uh, I think we should feel good about it. Um, oh shoot! For those of you who are um, checking out over on our YouTube, we've posted a new Stanex, um, you know, a, a, a doodle, a um, sketch, a sketch. Yeah, yeah. Um, it is a sketch of Owen, and he is balancing on a ball, juggling balls while typing. Uh, on his tiptoes and uh, yeah we're looking for a a, a, um, a caption for it but Stanix isn't going to be able to join us today so go over head over to the community section on our YouTube and check out a link to his website and a link to his Kickstarter which is pretty cool okay explain this Owen uh, okay so this is uh, Sympathy for the Devil uh, Bugbear PI, which um, Stan has had the idea for Bugbear PI for for decades, and I've always been a big fan. It's it's a bugbear, right? A, a fantasy goblinoid guy who happens to be a hard boiled private detective in a modern world that has fantasy elements, uh, and that does the sort of hard boiled uh, Sam Spade kind of cases, and this one is called Sympathy for the Devil. So. This will be a series of uh, chapter cards where you'll be able to get a story that'll have an illustration and a, a quick description of the action for that illustration, and it'll take you through the story. And uh, there is no license for doing a Bugbear PI uh, in Modern Age, but if you wanted to do Bugbear PI, um, Modern Age, maybe with grabbing a, a goblin species from Fantasy Age, would be a great way to have that sort of uh, modern fantasy magic element. Modern Age is set up really, really well for that, and uh, I, I have, I have thoughts about whether or not there might be some way to actually bring Bugbear Pi and Modern Age together someday. But I don't want to steal the thunder from his current Kickstarter. It funded in 24 hours, a little less, I think. It's at nearly double his funding, which means it's approaching its first stretch goal. Um, and Stan had no idea that we were going to boost his his uh, Kickstarter on this show, or I'm pretty sure he'd have been here. Uh, although I don't know what what took him away from us, but he pre sketched. But he's a, he's a big he's a big friend and patron of uh, Thursday. And, sure and is so much art for us. Oh uh, yeah, seemed, I mean just a ton. It seemed only appropriate to mention his current ongoing project. So I would go over there. Uh, the it's it's uh, the Make 100, which is the current Kickstarter sort of group push, uh, Bugbear PI, Sympathy for the Devil, over at Kickstarter. You can just do a Google search for it. Love it. Um, so I am uh, sorry. Someone uh, has an urgent uh, message to me that we'll have to wait. Uh, hopefully they don't need my kidney. 
Um, but yeah, so it's Thursday age. We're talking stunts. We're talking, um, we're in the basic, uh, the, the fantasy age basic rule book. And this is what part, th- I think this is our third, um, uh, part three of our deep dive into the basic rule book. Yeah, it is. And, um, we, we talked about combat stunts and magic stunts fairly extensively before, and I suspect we will talk about them again. Um, what I really want to focus on today is exploration stunts, and then if we have the time, role-playing stunts. And I want to talk about them for a specific reason. Um, there is sort of a right way and a wrong way to use exploration stunts and, to a lesser extent, role-playing stunts. And I don't think we necessarily do a good enough job of explaining that. Uh, it's sort of like, you know, if you have a, a bestiary of monsters and no one says, by the way, this one is set up to, to fight and kill. This one is set up to maybe be a, a helpful tavern keeper. Uh, this one is set up to be an allied healer. And if you don't, by looking at them instinctively, know that's what they're there for, and you have a fight where four healers jump out of the woods and attack the party as bandits, uh, it's not going to work the way that we, the game designers, intended. And we didn't necessarily warn you that that could be a problem. So, uh, exploration stunts uh, are in the core rule book, and Stan put up a, a link to them um, for uh, the, the Fantasy Age stunt tables. The Wait, who did? You did. What did I say? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, you you, uh, you compared me to Stan. I am flattered, uh, to be sure, but so, I sure... I'm looking, no, I, I'm looking at, at Stan's name. And, and <laughs> not a problem, not a problem. Troy! <laughs> this is voice is, put up a link to them. I did, I did. Um, um, so, yeah. uh, exploration stunts come up when characters are exploring. And that seems obvious and intuitive, but if you don't as a GM, read through the stunts and see what they can do. You might well have people making checks that can result in exploration stunts that won't have any impact on the exploration they are doing. So if you look through the stunts, uh, I'm going to pick a few specific examples. Um, There is uh, efficient search, which takes two stunt points. Uh, If any resources of any kind are typically consumed in the course of your test, you only use half as much. And speedy search. You complete your test in half the time it would otherwise take. Now, those are pretty obvious and intuitive, but in a lot of games, if you have not set up some sort of time limit or some sort of resource cost, they don't actually matter. And that is unfortunate because there are tons of stories to be told about exploring a region and only being able to go out so many days and you know, the old uh, hex crawl sort of exploration adventures would have a blank map and each hex would be one day's travel and people would have to say, okay, we're going to go one hex out from our last campsite. All right, now we have to decide if we're going to camp or go back. We'll go one hex up more the next day. And every day you have to burn, you know, say five silver worth of goods. Well, I have a a real quick question for you. Just to, to take a step back and imagine I'm listening for the very first time how do I get a stunt? So uh, the the core conceit of Fantasy Age, the thing that makes it really special and different beyond being a, a flexible, easy, fast fantasy game system, but the whole adventure game engine, you make a check, a test, you roll three six-sided dice. Uh, one of those three dice is a different color or different size. You can determine it from the other two easily. Um, and if any two dice are doubles then you get a number of stunt points equal to the stunt die. So Mm -hmm. if I roll two threes and a five, and one of the threes is my stunt die, then I get three stunt points that I can spend on stunts. If I rolled two threes and a five, and the five was my stunt die, I would get five stunt points. And for combat stunts, it's quite obvious when you're making an attack roll, uh, you can get a combat stunt, and that can let you penetrate armor, attack more quickly, move people around. Uh, Nice. For spellcasting stunts, uh, you can do magic-related things, and every spell has a test to see if you can cast it, uh, and they have a spell power that is effective, how effective the spell is, they've got a magic point cost. So with spell stunts, it's pretty straightforward that if you, if you 
roll two stunt points and you pick skillful casting, you reduce the magic point cost of the spell by one, which can reduce the cost to zero. That's obviously useful. There are things that'll do extra damage. There are things that let you immediately cast a second spell after your first spell. Um, those all interact very easily and quickly with the core rules of the system. So anytime combat stunts or spell stunts come up, it's pretty obvious how to use them. Nice. But if someone is uh, trekking through the wilderness and you're like, okay, uh, make a, a appropriate uh, ability test in order to not get lost, then they are exploring. And while exploring, they might well find themselves rolling doubles and getting stunt points. And then, quite reasonably, they want to use those stunts for something. And if you've set up your adventure uh, to allow for that, to be set up for that, it will work quite well. Otherwise, it might not be particularly relevant. Um, so, for example, uh, you might have, a, there's an intelligence-focused uh, navigation, which allows you to, to navigate and move around and, and such. If you were saying, okay, you all are on a boat, uh, there are a lot of boats in Fantasy Age, we tend to, to link things to uh, the Freeport setting, and, and the, we'll be expanding that more in the upcoming core rulebook later this year. Um, and you say, make a, a navigation check to see if you can successfully make it from where you are uh, to the land of the carnivorous pitcher plants, because the sap from carnivorous pitcher plants is is good eating, and you can drain them and... and fight the plants and run into all sorts of problems. Um, but the whole point is to get there. If you have told them, okay, that journey takes two weeks and you only have four weeks of supplies on your ship, when they make their test, they can, if they get stunt points, say, oh, look, uh, we normally use four weeks of supplies. Um, or two weeks of supplies, of which we only have four. But if I do an efficient search, uh, we ended up drawing in fish from the net. We found a little tiny island that, that had some fresh water. So instead of two weeks worth of supplies, we only used one week. We've got three weeks left, which means after this adventure here on the island of the carnivorous pitcher plants, we will be able to do more exploring before we have to go back to port. Uh, similarly with speedy search, right? Uh, if you say, hey, you can complete your test in half the time it would otherwise take, obviously, instead of being two weeks to go out to navigate your way to this island, it's just one week. You, you catch a good tide, you, you get a, a trade wind, something gets you there very, very quickly. Other kinds of exploration stunts might come up uh, if you are making perception checks, tracking would come up fairly often. And with those, you want to call for them in situations where if efficient search and speedy search don't make sense, if you're not telling people we got to track how much time it takes and it's relevant to the game or how much resources you have, uh, you want to make those tracking tests leading up to something interesting like a fight. And the reason for that is that the other stunts tend to have to do something with ending up in combat. Um, there's one stunt point for advantageous positioning that allows you to position yourself usefully after the GM describes what you found. So if you are tracking someone and they are setting an ambush and you burn a stunt point because you earned it on the tracking check, instead of walking into the ambush, the GM can explain the situation. You can say, oh, well, instead of walking into their ambush, I would like to position myself to be behind the people that are planning on jumping us. And that will start the fight. <laughs> uh, there's also uh, the upper hand if your discoveries lead to combat within a moment or two you receive a plus three bonus on your initiative roll so you could use that one uh, if you are when you get there the GM says there is an ambush you're not sure how many people are there then you've got the object of your attention for three stunt points which gives you a bonus to further test to examine or perceive additional aspects of the object of your test um, and then there's just with a flourish uh, those nearby have a plus one bonus on a po you have a plus one bonus on a post tense against them until the timer venue changes. All of these things can come up in an encounter quite easily, but for the exploration stunts to work best, the game master needs to set things up so that they become relevant in the encounter right after the roll. 
uh, we have uh, someone saying uh, whole combat system. Uh, let's see, uh, upcoming horror book later this year from the Murder Hobo Show. Yeah, uh, later this year, um, not in the first quarter, uh, maybe end of the second or sometime in the third. With shipping and printing the way it is, uh, if if it shows up in December, I'm still going to call it good for this year. Uh, but later this year, there will be a new core rule book. We've play tested it. Uh, I've made two development passes, uh, Malcolm and, and, uh, Chris, who are also age gurus and Chris obviously invented the system are making a development pass and will then go through editing and layout, et cetera. Uh, but it's going to be a, a quality of life improvement for fantasy age. So while it replaces the basic rule book, which is why we'll be calling the new book, the core rule book, um, it should still work with all the previous Fantasy Age adventures and expansion books and the bestiary and layers and all of that stuff. So some things are handled differently, but the things that are handled differently in that book are all things that you swap out the entire system and then the stat blocks that exist in other books will still function with it. Uh, we're very excited about it. And obviously stunts and, you know, we, we redesigned how classes work. We added new class, the Envoy, which is sort of the face, the, the social interaction character. Um, and we're going to do another whole set of shows about stunts, I assure you, once the core rulebook is out and you can see what we've done with them. We're trying very, very hard to sort of split the, the Gordian knot of if there aren't enough stunts, people get bored with coming up with stunt points if there are only a few things to do. If there are too many stunts, people feel like they have to memorize the 60 things that can potentially happen, uh, especially for game masters that can be tricky, uh, in order to successfully run quickly with the system. And you can get bogged down by people saying, okay, well, uh, I've got 10 general combat stunts and I've got 10 uh, special stunts I have as a, a gunslinger or musketeer or whatever. Um, and there are five more stunts that I've got from magic items. And so uh, it's going to take me an hour and a half to decide how to spend my three stunt points. Um, some groups don't have those problems, and that's great. But uh, we have tried really hard for the core rulebook to come up with a system that will have a decent selection of basic stunts for all these different situations, uh, but also classes will have access as they go up to either select a basic stunt and make it cheaper or to pick up a class specific stunt but those only become relevant as players take them or a gm decides to add one to a monster which means that even if there are 10 or 15 or 107 I, there aren't 107 no matter how many warrior specific stunts there are only the ones that characters have taken or the GM decides to give NPCs are relevant in a given game. So you don't have to worry about the rest unless you level up and get a pick. And then that hopefully happens outside of game time. You update your character in between games. You look through them and you think, oh, this one is something I really want to do. But you don't even have to add those new stunts. You can just reduce the cost of existing stunts, which means that things like penetrating armor or moving more quickly or attacking twice uh, can become easier and easier for warriors, whereas... Uh, exploration stunts become easier and easier for rogues, and social stunts, uh, role-playing stunts become easier and easier for envoys, and magic stunts quite reasonably become easier and easier for mages. Uh, so, so, Owen, I, I have a quick question. Um, I'm, yeah. I'm, 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 you know, maybe not so much a quick question, <laughs> uh, but our friend Rain's talking about um, feeling like exploration stunts. Uh, and role-playing stunts get left behind because it requires such an overhead from uh, for you know from GMs and, and players. You know what what do you say to that? Um, when you are as a GM designing a exploration encounter or a role-playing encounter, I recommend that when you are at that first stage where you're trying to figure out where is the encounter going to take place, how are the players going to get there, that conceptual stage, pop open those stunt charts and just pick one or two stunts that will be relevant for that encounter. Um, because if you've got just a couple of stunts and they're relatively obvious, then players will select the stunts that will tie into that system. I don't think we need an entire set of social combat with social combat stunts with a whole network supporting it. That gets really, really crunchy. What you really want is just to be aware of what things does the adventure game engine suggest stunts make you better at, and therefore 
how can I use those in an encounter? Um, and I've talked about exploration stunts a lot, so let's look at role-playing stunts. Uh, for one stunt point, uh, if you were making a, a social encounter, so if you're trying to be diplomatic or cow someone or fool them, uh, for one stunt point, you can have a bon mot. You tag the perfect witty remark onto the end of your action, affecting all those who hear it that much more deeply. If you can't think of one, the rest of the players and GM quickly brainstorms options and you can choose among them. Uh, word of your wit is likely to spread, for good or ill. Now, that does not have a game mechanical effect, right? It just says word of your wit is likely to spread. But if you are the GM, you can, when you're setting up an encounter, go, okay, uh, there are three merchants here. The three merchants are all trying to, to get the, G, the, the players to, to buy their goods. They're all trying to charge a premium. And you just decide, hey... <clears throat> one of these guys really appreciates a good bon mot. So if someone burns the point on that and the group can take a moment to say what would be really funny or clever here, and then you as the GM go, okay, that, that merchant laughs out loud and says, you know, I like you. I take it back. You can buy stuff at 10% off instead of 10% extra. And you have then caused that stunt to interact with the encounter. So real quick, that sounds a little ominous. Word of your wit is likely to spread for good or ill. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm well known for loving a pun, right? There are yeah. people that hate puns. So if you have someone who keeps hitting Bon Mott and keeps using it for the pun, you can always have a later encounter that ties us all together. Maybe some guard is like, oh, you're the guy who thinks he's funny. And then he automatically dislikes you unless you can then sway the crowd or pull a jest or maybe even you decide to flirt. Um, all the role-playing stunts can be seen as uh, suggestions to the GM for how to play the role-playing, right? Uh, some of them are, are flat mechanical. Tower of Will, uh, you get a plus one bonus to any opposed check when an opponent tries to put you at an emotional disadvantage by intimidating you, impressing you, bargaining with you, and so on. Um, that is actually a flat mechanical advantage, and people will frequently go for it. But if you are looking at uh, sway the crowd, um, then your efforts spill over into others in the area, and you affect an additional person of choice past the original target, which means if I am trying to make this person a friend or bargain with them, then when I sway the crowd, the GM can go, oh, all right, uh, in addition to convincing the, the guard who didn't like you uh, that maybe you're not such a bad person after all, there's someone in the audience who also takes a liking to you. I have these NPCs I was planning on introducing later. That is a way to maybe say, hey, this, this nobleman who I was thinking of becoming a patron uh, or the flower girl who's secretly a spy um, or the, the, the bunny centaur who is here to try and find people to help him take a caravan back to his bunny centaur nation so that it is possible to to save them from a encroaching plague. Whatever it is you were thinking of doing, you then make this the thing that connects to that. Frequently, um, game masters often are just going with the flow, right? You're, you're improving interactions, and you may have some notes. Uh, you know, Dwarven Blacksmith is grumpy, has dirty beard. That's all you've got. <laughs> but if you've got that, and he's grumpy, and then someone comes along with Flirt uh, and decides that they become enamored with you, they specifically say in Flirt what exactly this means in the moment and how it might play out in the long run or up to the GM. So you might flirt with the, the grumpy, dirty-bearded blacksmith, and he goes, oh, fine. All right. You, <laughs> you I like. You, I will deal with. Feel free to knock on the back anytime you need something, and I, I, I won't yell at you uh, or make you pay double for interrupting me. And the next time you see him, maybe he's combed his beard out, and that's as far as that goes. <laughs> you have successfully gotten him to want to interact with you uh, because he likes you. He, maybe he just likes having you around. Maybe they offer you a job. So for the role-playing stunts, what you really want to do as a GM is be vaguely familiar with them and then just be ready to roll with the flow whenever a, a player pulls these. And it's an opportunity 
for the game master to have the players tell them what what they are interested in as an encounter. If they are constantly hitting Bon Mott and Jest, right, um, then you know that they want to be witty or perceived as witty characters. And that can be a great way for a player who is himself not quick at being funny or or witty or uh, 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 sharp-edged in combat or, or in uh, negotiation and in, in conversation, not combat, the exact opposite, uh, to have a character that they are expressing as this is the witty, funny, uh, scaramouche, does poetry and insults while fencing with someone character. Sure, yeah, yeah. Verbal right. combat. Exactly. It's it, Those are classic tropes that players aren't always themselves good at. And this gives them an opportunity to say, this is what I want for this character. And the GM can then use that as guideposts. Here's the road. This is what they want to do. Did they choose and another thing where they weave a second thrust of the conversation in and and the, the GM goes, okay, they're just going to drop the previous argument, and now they're going to work on this new one. And the guard forgets all about the fact that he was originally here because you all were wearing your weapons without peace-tying them in the streets, and instead is just arguing about whether or not puns are the worst form of humor. And win or lose, he then lets you go, and it's only later that he thinks, wait, those were the droids I was looking for. <laughs> uh, I do have to say, you know, in, in this case... Uh, there are some of us that, you know, we don't choose the Bon Mott. The Bon Mott chooses us. Totally. Yeah. Uh, but it's the, the whole point of these is to give uh, characters who are making those checks the sort of change the encounter opportunity that magic stunts and combat stunts give characters who are focused on casting spells and engaging in combat. And these are so, just as tactical, though, right? I mean, they're just as important. They can play a pretty huge role in changing the course. Yeah, they're, they're, they're more wibbly-wobbly on purpose, right? Because we don't want to have a stunt that says, uh, with this stunt, this character now likes you no matter what, because that's the stunt people always pick when they feel face the evil necromancer and if it says he automatically treats you as his best friend i mean you could claim well it's a necromancer he's going to kill and reanimate you because that's what he did with his best friend but the point is just to give <laughs> guidance and a way for players to affect the social encounters the role-playing encounters and if you are as a gm seeing every encounter as here's a challenge there are a few different ways it could go uh, some are better, some are worse, um, and and this is the range, right? If you're facing the necromancer, there's there's every opportunity, perhaps, that he will fight you no matter what. But I, I will give a an example in a classic movie that many of you will probably be too young to have seen in the theaters and may never have watched, but the Flash Gordon movie from the 80s. Oh, yeah. Uh, Ming, Ming the Merciless becomes so impressed with Flash that... When he has Flash at a disadvantage and can kill him immediately on, on the Hawkman City, he instead says, look, it's a shame to waste your potential. Why don't you come work for me? We'll only mostly blow up the Earth. They'll be cowed. I'll put you in charge of it. You'll become a, priest, uh, a prince of Mongo and, and turn to my side. Now, there's no chance Flash is going to do that. But Ming, the villain, has been impressed by these Bon Mott's and social encounters and, and the fact that he's he's an upstanding, impressive guy and says, I'll give you some time to think about it. If you're the game master and, you know, you probably don't have Ming the Merger's list. If you do, it's probably not Max von Seto. Um, but if you've got the, the evil necromancer, uh, the queen of graves, uh, here's the, the, the three-eyed horned wolf, which is the evil spirit that is preventing anyone from sleeping in the woods. Uh, and someone does these social encounters, you don't have to decide that means that the, the three-eyed horned wolf suddenly treats them all like friends, but it could say, I understand why you've come here. I understand what you think you're going to accomplish. I'm still going to rip all your throats out, but I'm not going to do it tonight. I'm going <laughs> to let you sleep on it for a night. Marinate that. You yeah. really want to be here, and I'll come tear out your throats if you're still here tomorrow. 
that is still a change in how that encounter might go. And it doesn't take away from your opportunity as a GM to have a fight with the, the three-eyed horned wolf that you spent all this time writing up the stop block and you've got a cool encounter planned and he can breathe a, a coat of bees, whatever. Um, <laughs> but, I do like that. I he wrote, Oh, go ahead. I'm oh, sorry. But it means that the players, then they've seen him once, they can make plans, they get an extra 24 hours, they can try and build themselves a defensible position because he said he's coming the next night. You still get that fight, but you give players the sense that their social skills, their interactions, their role-playing matter and can alter the exact details of the encounter. And that's all you need to do. They don't have to bypass anything. No stunt is designed to take away the GM's toys. They're an additional set of toys that the GMs and the players share to tell a cooperative story where it is impacted and maybe changes lanes and, and you're, you're doing the trolley problem and they're telling you which track they want to be on. Uh, and you still get to do all the stuff you're going to do, but you get to bring in those cool moments that we all like when the, the hero and the villain or, or the hero and the, the rival that ends up becoming the ally, whatever, um, you know, the, the Wookiee gladiator that was planning on killing you and now you've, you've had a conversation with him and now he works for you. These are all places where you can alter the flow of the story and the players get really involved, really engaged because they know, oh, I took this option with this stunt. This is a thing that doesn't happen all the time. And I can see that the game master is changing the flow of the narrative. And even if we end up still at the fight at the end, maybe at the end when the, the three-eyed horned, is that what I said? Three-eyed horned wolf? I almost did a three wolf Horned, Three horned um, guy, yeah. <laughs> uh, it, it maybe if you defeat him, you know he he gives a big sigh and says it's it's hard to find a good enemy. I've I've honored this moment, and then later you can have him like start if you want to do a new adventure. The the spirit of the three eyed horned wolf comes to the players in their dreams and they say, hey, there's this this even greater problem that I was never able to deal with that I think you could. And since you defeated me, I will honor you with the knowledge of what is coming. And then it becomes a, a lead into another adventure. Quickly. Well, and look at that. And so what we're talking about, friends, I want to say hey to Jonesy. I want to say hey to Duke. Um, they've stopped by better late than never. And for people that are going to be picking up uh, the three wolf eyed horn. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but for those of you who are wondering, what the heck are we talking about? It is, uh, well, it's stunts day. We're talking about stunts. And um, that is, uh, it actually starts on page 60. No, not 60. Um, hold on. Don't say it. Owen. Don't say it. Let's pretend like I know what I'm doing. And it is on, um, uh, you were going to find th the stuff that we're talking about on page 79, wasn't it? And so, seven, it starts at 78 where we kind of, or 76 where we kind of start talking about all of this good stuff. Um, but we're talking about yeah, explorations. But, Go ahead. I'm sorry. The, the exploration stunts and the role-playing stunts are on page 79 and stunts in general talk in 78. And they, <laughs> they talk about uh, which stunts can I use and, and where. Yeah. Another thing you can do is if a player thinks of something appropriate with an exploration stunt or a role-playing stunt, in a situation that you didn't think they were going to be used, uh, you can go with the flow, right? If it's the middle of a fight and they are hammer and tongs going at it uh, with the, the Dark Lord's high guard, and someone says, I have one stunt point, I want to go ahead and rip off a Bon Mott. Uh, and you're like, okay, this is a fight. You could shift by a yard. But no, you want a Bon Mott. Great. So <laughs> you and the captain start throwing, you know, jokes and insults at each other and laughing during the course of this fight. If you win, you might be able to turn him to your side or have him carry a message. Or if he gives his, his parole, he will honestly not try and escape. He'll keep to his word because you have forced a connection with him. If he defeats you, there's now the opportunity that says, all right, I know that our orders are to kill them. But these are not what the Dark Emperor expected. We'll take them to our Lord, and he will have the opportunity to kill them. Um, all of that because someone decided to spend one stunt point on, hey, I want to have something clever to say. It's just, they're, they're windows and they're opportunities. They're these little suggestions on how the scene can go. And all a GM needs to do, I mean, we've got uh, cards with all the stunts on them in the GM's kit. 
uh, but you can also, I, I generally speaking, have the stunt cables that uh, Troy is, is sharing with you all for free. I've got those up on my computer just so if someone says, hey, can I whip out a stun silence in combat? And I'm like, well, it specifically says outside of combat, it lasts for your character to be into something. But inside combat, it's at least a full round. Yeah, you dumbfound them. Go ahead and whip out a stun silence for one full round. And, and that's the case, right, where someone was like, I've got to buy some time before the, the uh, Ronan the Accuser destroys us all. I challenge him to a dance-off because I have three stunt points <laughs> and I'm going to go for a stun silence. And even though this was a fight, he's going to take a round to go, what are you <laughs> doing? An adventurer these, after my own heart. <laughs> these are the opportunities for those things that, you know, you, you don't want to set a test number and say, hey, if you make a communications check at this level, you can automatically cause the most villainous creature in the world uh, to go with the dance off because then players are like, well, uh, challenging people to a dance off is our best tactical option all the time. <laughs> right. But stunt points don't come up that often. Three stunt points, I mean, roughly a quarter of all checks have some stunt points, but three stunt points uh, takes even more than that. And if people are getting creative with them, allowing them to influence the encounter without shutting it down, I mean, no one stunt should, generally speaking, bypass an entire encounter although sure if there's only one guy left if you, if you killed everyone else and someone says hey i want to use uh uh and another thing and convince him to surrender rather than continue the fight and you're like okay maybe he'll surrender there's just one guy left rather than roll dice have him make a, a morale test i'll go ahead and say this works because at an appropriate moment you chose an appropriate stunt I love that. I love, you know, I'm, I'm looking at the, uh, at the list and that, and another thing is, is really my, like, I wish, I wish I could use that regularly. I'm always like three days later, like, Oh yeah, that's what I should have said. I should have said that. Um, I love it. Um, so, uh, how many, I know that we're, um, we're, we, we've talked about these particular stunts because they're non-combat and uh, they're kind of the wibbly wobbly, as you say, uh, social kind of stunts. And I, you know, do we want to dig into some of the other stunts and talk about their, their kind of uh, interplay and sort of juxtaposition against the, uh, the more soft skills, if you will? Yeah, uh, because I think some of the same rules of being prepared can be useful uh, for some combat stunts, right? Um, so looking at combat stunts, which is a bigger list, uh, because it's easier to have specific things happen in combat, because combat is probably the crunchiest part of Fantasy Age, right? This this is a game uh, where we want, in general, to know where you are, who you're near, what you're doing. Uh, we've got things like being prone and, and uh, doing damage, and, and there are armor ratings. So there are specific things. So... Uh, there are some really obvious ones that don't really require a lot of interpretation. Um, rapid reload. You can immediately reload a missile weapon. Great. The, the missile weapons all tell you how long it normally takes to reload them. That is an obvious choice. Um, defensive stance gives you additional bonus. Disarm. Uh, you've got a chance to knock someone's weapon loose. Uh, we have seen all those things in, in fights and fencing and movies, etc. Um, there are some ones that can get a little more interpretational and this is going to be a a group dynamic question a play style dynamic um if you are facing a knight a mounted knight and you roll two stunts and you get knock prone a lot of players are going to say hey can i knock the horse prone or if not can i knock the knight off the horse and he becomes prone um and it is perfectly reasonable for a GM to make a ruling. Uh, just try and be consistent with it. So if you say, yeah, I mean, it says you knock your enemy prone, so rules as written, you can knock the horse prone. Uh, that's, you know, the scene where Conan the Barbarian punches the camel and the poor thing passes out. Uh, right, but, you know, classic fantasy movie. True, um, true. Or, or you trip it. Uh, can I knock the knight prone? It doesn't say you'll knock someone off their horse, but being prone while still on your saddle doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense. Um, though you could say, hey, you're knocking prone. You don't knock him off the saddle, but until he spends a move to re-sit in his saddle, 
people will get the normal plus one bonus on attack rolls against him. Um, disarm, uh, disarm frequently comes up when you've, in addition to weapons, you've got things like uh, the the big bad uh, evil genius is holding a crystal skull and there are beams coming out of it and he's swinging it across the field and hitting people and someone's like, hey, can I run up there and disarm him of the skull? That's a GM call. And you can say, it's really in your power to say, no, that's designed to disarm weapons or as it happens, this can't be disarmed from him uh, because the magic is bolting it to his hand, just like if a dragon was breathing fire on you, that couldn't be disarmed. And then you just tell the player, right? It's, it's not designed for that. But on the flip side of that, if someone gets a disarm and they are fighting a rhinoceros and they say, can I disarm the rhinoceros's horn? You can say, you know what? Go ahead and, and uh, make your opposed attack roll and see if you shatter the horn off the mechanical rhinoceros and disarm it of its innate weaponry. These are just options where if someone wants to get creative, you as the GM uh, and hopefully your players in concert have to decide how creative you want to let these things get. Uh, my players hit taunt all the time. Um, <laughs> and frequently, uh, all it officially says is that the target suffers a penalty to attack rolls and cast rolls on the next turn. But also in my games, if you taunt someone, Unless there's a good reason why you aren't the target of their wrath after that, it, chances are they're coming after you. Um, set up, dual strike, seize the initiative, lethal blow. These these are all pretty self-explanatory. Um, the magic stunts, uh, again, are pretty straightforward. Uh, powerful casting increases the spell power of your spell. Uh, for some spells, the spell power doesn't matter. There's no variable based on the spell power. I certainly have had people do things like say, hey, uh, I want to create light. Um, I want the light to be bright enough that I can hold the pack of wolves at bay for a round. Can I burn a stunt point for powerful casting to do that? And then I can look at, uh, okay, well, look, there's already imposing spell uh, that anyone who's trying to attack you has to make a willpower courage test. So rather than let you doing it as a powerful casting, I think what you're really trying is an opposing imposing spell with a different effect. So if you've got those four student points, I'll let you do it. Or I'll let you do it with one, uh, but they are going to get a big bonus to their willpower, you know, plus three bonus because you're three stunt points short. Um, you, you want to be ready for enough loosey-goosey ad hoc stuff to make things interesting and not deviate from the rules so much that players feel like what really matters isn't the rules of the game but how good they are on convincing you to allow their random bs to work and that's a, <laughs> that's a, a a narrow line um no one gets it right all the time and some people get it right none of the time uh, i tend to lean on the I, I say i err on the side of awesome um which is if something is clearly out of bounds or too powerful or like i said if you're trying to spend one stunt point for something that's supposed to cost four uh, i generally speaking don't allow it whereas if someone ends up doing something that is right on the cusp where i'm not sure if it's a good call or not but it seems awesome for the story i allow it uh, i have had people for example who are, you know, their their allies are down and unconscious. There are uh, swarms of bugs coming at them. What they have is a torch, and they want to know, can I hold them at bay with my torch using stunt points for just a round or two because I got some stunts? Because damaging one or two of these swarms won't do any good. What I need to do is buy time. Uh, there is no stunt that specifically does that. But if someone says, hey, I've got three stunt points I will put into trying to use the torch to hold the, the hordes of scarabs that are going to eat us at bay. And I'm thinking to myself, well, I don't necessarily want to allow that all the time. On the other hand, uh, I cannot think of a movie with hordes of, of little insects where someone has a torch that waves at them where they don't pause. That's iconic. It's reasonable. Right. Um, so that's where I will err on the side of awesome. I'm not sure if I want to allow this all the time. And I'll tell the, the player, you know, I'm not saying this will work for all creatures or all swarms or all torches. But yes, in the circumstance you're in right now, I'll allow that. Uh, you've made it. Go ahead and, and make a, a, 
opposed test like you would if you were disarming. And we'll see how their morale goes uh, against your attempts to intimidate them. I like that. And that goes right in line with, you know, um, our buddy was talking about in chat, um, you know, and make sure when you're coming by and you're lo you're watching this stuff um, on demand that you uh, check that chat because there are links in there to free stuff and all kinds of goodies. So you don't want to miss it and some uh, bon mots, if you will. But uh, yeah, yeah. So um, looking at what Rain says here, yeah, the most valuable advice I've ever gotten for stunts is you have permission to mix them up and make, you know, interpret them as you need and go for the awesome, right? I mean, just make it, make it not so awesome that it ruins everything for everybody at the table, but you know, fun with a twist is, uh, is fun nonetheless. Yeah. I think fun with a twist is, I mean, that's, that's exactly the right advice, right? Uh, you have permission to mix them up, interpret them as you need them. Um, and, uh, get used to, how your GM uses them and how your players want to use them. And if those things don't seem to mesh up, just have a conversation about it, right? If you as the player are like, hey, I'm, I feel like you keep shutting down what I want to do with sense that's outside the norm, should I just stick to what's in the book? Or is it okay if I make suggestions and you just don't like the ones I have? Or as a GM, if you're like, hey guys, I don't mind if you get a little flexible with how you're describing these things. I don't care if you stun them into silence uh, by showing a cheesy smile or saying something or, or, you know, turning around and slapping your butt at them, that's all fine, but we're going to stick with the game effects as listed. Just have those conversations if people are, are out of your comfort zone. Well, that old move, the old slap your butt at the enemy. Well, Braveheart, <laughs> right? I mean, that's literally a scene from that movie. It is, that's right. It is. And maybe a scene from my life, Owen. Um, well, I mean, yeah. you're disembodied, so I presume you're just slapping a conceptual button. You know, one, one day, one time, um, you know, that is uh, uh, exactly, um, you know, uh, how I will do my thing. Um, let's see. Do, 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 do. Sorry, I was just doing a little little cleanup on Isle Ruski. Um, okay, so, uh, okay, so here we are. We've covered stunts. I mean, we've talked about sort of uh, some you know, some of the the ways that some of the more wibbly wobbly stunts can Im be an important impact on the world at large or that, you know, on your, on your session. Um, what are, are we missing any pieces of, of, you know, uh, stunts and the, and the stunt economy, if you will? Um, so that the other thing I think is worth noting and, and, you know, we're sort of doing a deep dive on the basic stunts. Uh, there are other places where stunts can come up um, in the book layers uh, we have layer stunt, which is things that creatures can do within their layer. And I think that that is a great uh, tie-in to locational stunts in general, right? I've talked about this before, but if you as the GM uh, want to make available that during the fight, you can cut the rope of the chandelier and drop it on someone, just tell people, hey, here's this one-time stunt that's available in this room because there is a chandelier. The first person to spend three stunt points on it can drop the chandelier on somebody. Uh, and I put it together for this one location, this one session. The nice thing about doing that sort of thing as a game master is that you are setting people up with the awareness that this is a special circumstance, right? Uh, if they are fighting on a frozen lake, you can say, hey, you guys can spend stunt points to try and break the lake and everybody falls in and the fight's over and then it's a survival check. Uh, and it's up to you all whether you want to try and shatter the ice or not. But that doesn't mean that every time that you are anywhere, you'll be able to shatter the floor and everyone fall in. On the other hand, if people are then fighting five game sessions later in a burning tavern on the third floor and someone says, hey, can I try and shatter the burning floor like we had the option with that frozen lake? Is that about the same level of difficulty? The GM is empowered to say yes or no based on what they feel like doing. Uh, the other neat thing that you can do with stunts as a GM is use stunts for things like magic items. Um, it would be super easy if you wanted to have a flaming sword, for example, to just say, hey, uh, you can do mighty blow for one stunt point and lethal bow for four stunt points. So in both cases, one point cheaper. Uh, and the extra damage is fire damage because you have a flaming sword. I have now created a stunt that is tied to this specific magic item and they work within the system so you don't have to learn a whole new set of rules, but it's a 
quick and easy, interesting way. And then you could even say, you know, all right, uh, there's in addition to being able to do Mighty Blow and Lethal Blow for one sort of less, uh, you've got an opportunity to set someone on fire. And I just picked, that's say, four stunt points, and then they take a die six fire damage every round because you have set them on fire. And that is a way that you can create nearly anything from uh, all of, of genre fiction, all of fantasy events, uh, with one or another magic item with a stunt tied to it. And you can do the same thing with, you know, if if there's a, uh, to, to borrow a, a strange example, uh, Mr. Mix Mixelplick, the uh, Superman villain, goes away if you get him to say his name backwards, if you trick him into that. If you want to have that villain, if you have an evil sorcerer and you trick him into saying his name backwards, he teleports back to his home dimension. Um, you can just tell people, hey, you're welcome to try and trick him into it. I'm welcome, happy to do opposed tests. But the main thing is that when you're interacting with him, if you spend this many stunt points, you successfully get this specific circumstance for him. And there are all sorts of, of things in, in mythology and legend that, you know, if you get them to say they name or they reveal themselves or they can't uh, approach a cross uh, or they can't cross running water. These are all places where you can say, hey, this monster has a vulnerability to any set of objects that are in the shape of any holy symbol. Here is a stunt that works against that one monster. Um, and if you make the necessary you know, test to have the knowledge that he's got that vulnerability, then this comes up only when you're facing that one creature. So that's sort of um, encounter design stunt is the sort of thing that you can use as a GM even beyond the tables. Uh, my one recommendation is that if you don't tell players that these things happen, that they exist, if you don't say there's there's a potential vulnerability if you research them, uh, then you may do the work for nothing because if a player doesn't know the stunt exists, they obviously won't select it. There you go. There you go. Uh, you know, so all of this very sound advice. Um, very interesting stuff. You can uh, remember to download your um, free uh, stunt tables PDF uh, over at Free Ronin. And you know, if I were you, I'd just dig around a little bit over there at Free Ronin. I I was looking, and I think we've forgotten how many great free things are there. So get over there and check that whole library out. It's it's pretty awesome, and we are continually adding new things to it um you know in the waning moments of the show you know we made some we made some big announcements um in the in the world of age uh the adventure a game engine and one of them look at this this is our um big announcement about cthulhu awakens our kickstarter that's pretty darn exciting and i i i am a huge of the mythos. I mean, I just, it just, it's evocative to me. I really, really enjoy it. Um, it's, it's a fun thing. Um, and, uh, really excited about what we have cooking. Um, you know, to check that out, you're going to want to head over, um, to our blog, go over to greenrunner.com. You'll check out that link. We've also got, um, our, our buddy Malcolm, uh, another age designer, uh, is heading up this project and, uh, has put together a frequently asked questions, which you will find, um, this is a version, uh, 0.5, um, of the Cthulhu Awakens fact that you'll find on our site. That's going to transfer over to the Kickstarter, of course, once that starts, but yeah, check, click those links and you'll head on over to the Cthulhu Awakens roleplay game at Kickstarter and, um, grab yourself a, you know, a notification. We've got tons of people who are ready to pick it up. So get over there and, uh, and get in line. Um, I'm excited about this. I'm super hyped about it. I've, I've gotten to see some of the stuff in advance, and I'm I am looking forward to uh, seeing people get to play with the tools in that toolbox. Yeah, you know, we are also planning a bunch of live streams. We're going to be doing some uh, uh, kickoff streams and some uh, end of uh, you know end of the uh, Kickstarter streams and uh, be big celebration uh, as well as some actual plays. And so, if you've got some interest, you know how to get a hold of us if you want to jump in and play a little early look in front of the world at large. Um, yeah, send us a note. Let's play at greenronin.com, and yeah, we'll we'll, we'll have some fun. Awesome. What? Can it, could this even happen? <laughs> Looking forward to using Fantasy Age with Cthulhu Awakens to do, and do some Dreamlands madness. Um, is that even possible? 
I mean, anyone uh, anyone who is comfortable combining Modern Age and Fantasy Age elements, or probably even Dragon Age or Blue Rose and Fantasy Age, should have no trouble combining uh, Cthulhu Awakens and Fantasy Age. Although, if the idea is popular enough, it is not impossible that we might do some Fantasy Age mythos things later after Cthulhu Awakens is out and uh, we have seen how it interacts with people's expectations. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, interact well, no doubt. I have no doubt about it. Um, hey, we've got five minutes left. Uh, Owen Casey Stevens, do you have anything that you would like to share? Uh, any uh, news? Um, any um, you know thoughts? Uh, while you do that, I'm going to pull up some of that artwork that we got from our buddy Stan. Uh, so I... Uh... I think next week I would like to touch on hazards in fantasy age. Uh, there's like one page, uh, two columns of material in the basic rule book. And yet it is potentially an entire category of encounter like combat or role playing or social encounters. Uh, and I think it's worth having come off stunts to immediately go into hazards and then talk about how the two can interact, especially uh, when one considers things like layer stunts. So I think hazards are underused and perhaps underappreciated as a GM tool uh, for adventure and interesting different kinds of encounters. So that's what I want to hit on next week. Um, I personally, I'll just note, uh, I have a lot of content on my blog. That's owencaseystevens.com, uh, which also has links to my Patreon, where people support my free work, a lot of which is uh, based on various D20 games, but I also talk reasonably often about the freelance life and gaming in general and essays of social things and mental health of my concern. Um, and I reasonably recently launched a uh, coffee page that is ko-fi.com forward slash Owen Casey Stevens. Most notably, that is where I keep the gallery of pictures of my housemate's cat, the adorable and beloved by people online, uh, Alphonse Lord Tubbington of Sausage on Trunk, Order of the Big Biter. Uh, we've got about such a handsome, a handsome uh, gentleman. He's he's a lovely, lovely, fine nobleman. Uh, and while I've been posting pictures of him for a while, I had not been gathering them all in one place. So, in addition to posting new pics there uh, and beginning to collate old pics there. Uh, there are also pictures of Lord Tubbington there that I have not posted anywhere else. Uh, they're all free to look at. Um, people are welcome to drop me a donation uh, because they love the cat pics. Uh, I'm, I'm literally trying to monetize somebody else's pet. Um, but oh, Hey, all... ingenious. I think it's brilliant. I think yeah. it's a brilliant move. Uh, but you're also welcome to just stop by and look at the the lovely, lovely chunky floof and uh, enjoy that there are cats on the internet, which I didn't invent. Uh, I'm just willing to uh, to follow that particular. <laughs> yes, I love it. Uh, let me see here real quick. Uh, just as a as a, a view, people can kind of see it for themselves. We'll do this, and then we'll do this. Boom! Look at that. Nice. Yeah, I like this little this little uh, program. Oh my gosh! Yeah, if you click on the gallery, there, there we go. There, there are the Alphonse picks. That so, is, uh, that is something. Um, wait, and wait, I'm wait. glad this is written down. Alphonse Lord Tubbington of Soft on Chonk Order of the Big Biter. Yep. Hashtag uh, Alphonse Lord Tubbington because I also use the hashtag on, on nice. Twitter and Facebook. And this is look at that face. Oh yeah. Cute, cute, That's, cute, cute. That one is Alphonse being all noble and regal. I love it. I love it. Um, uh, in that, in this waning minute, um, let me get. Uh, I will share this as well. Um, you know, I love restream, but they only let you set up one share thing <laughs> at a time, and so you got to kind of, got to kind of juggle and jump back and forth and do all this good stuff. But look at that! There we go. There's a Stan original um i sure like that guy that stan he's a he's a good friend and a great um uh artist he's a yeah he's a good time he is a very talented man uh hey you you know take a look at this we've got our community tab um uh we are granted um our uh our community tab it means that we are growing and it's all because you have taken the time to Stop what you're doing, and oh my gosh, look who it is. 
Dun da da da. Heard his voice Love. drop by to see what we were doing. He's like, "You dare? You yeah. dare?" And, and um, he did not get his permission to have him on screen, so obviously he. Uh, he uh, yeah, so everybody's got to pay royalties for looking upon his lordship. Um, but um, uh, you know, you know what you can do. You, you can get away with. Uh, I'm sure Lord Tubbington um, would grant us this this one boon, which would be stop what you're doing, take a look at where you are, make sure that you've liked and shared and made a great comment um it really helps us a great amount and uh you know your help thus far is a lot us to unlock the community um uh tab on youtube and we just are able to continue to grow and uh share the good word and um yeah thank you everybody for checking out um this episode if you've got questions very fine cat says brian very fine indeed. Um, and you can see us. We're here every Thursday, um, nearly every Thursday. And uh, we talk about uh, the Adventure Game Engine, uh, Fantasy Age, Modern Age, and all the ages um, have a little home here. And uh, on Mondays, we do Mutants and Masterminds Monday. That's at 2 p.m. Pacific. And uh, I'm your host, uh, Disembodied Troy. I'm uh, I'm just a voice in the distance uh, here to support superstars like Owen Casey Stevens. Owen, thanks for hanging out. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Everybody have a great rest of your week. And we will be back Monday with Mutants and Masterminds Monday. And, uh, you know, buckle up for some news. Cthulhu awakens. All right, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye, folks.